My name is Eric Jones and I'm director of the Robert Schumann Center. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to here today to talk about lessons from Brexit. And as we talk about lessons from Brexit, I can't think of anyone uh, better prepared to do so than Anon Menon. Uh, Anon Menon is director of UK and a Changing Europe and professor of international relations at King's College in London. Uh, over the last six years, Anon has been the academic face or rather the public face of British academe as it's wrestled with the many issues that have been involved in transitioning from being a member state uh, to being an independent free country able to take control uh, of its own legislative authority. Um, and along the way, Anon has become an expert in so many issues, it's almost impossible uh, to mention. Um, and, and I guess then uh, all we need to do is, is simply welcome Anon and hand over the floor to him so that we can figure out uh, what this Brexit was all about. So Anon, over to you. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rattle through uh, a bunch of potential lessons. This is very much obviously a work in progress because it's far, far too soon to be definitive about Brexit. So one of the big debates in the UK at the moment is about regulatory divergence, uh, how and whether the UK can benefit from such regulatory divergence. And even diehard Brexiters in the Conservative Party are now saying, well, it's going to be 20, 30 years before we really get whether or not this has worked or not. So, I mean, I suppose the first lesson from Brexit is it's not and will never really be over. Uh, but these are the things I'm going to talk about uh, the lessons we've learned about what it's like to leave the European Union, the lessons we've learned about divisions in the UK, our constitution and the nature of the British state, what we've learned about trade, what we've learned about our country, and very, very briefly at the end, uh, I'm going to try and talk a little bit about what we might expect to happen next. First thing then is, and there's a, there's a paradox here, because... For many Brexiters, the reason for leaving the European Union was because the European Union had become something far more than a common market. It was complicated, it was legalistic, it was bureaucratic. And so you would have thought intuitively that those Eurosceptics would have known better than anyone else that whilst leaving might be desirable, the one thing it wouldn't be is straightforward. And yet, of course, there was a tension amongst a lot of them because the very same people who were saying the EU is an unbearably complex, legalistic, bureaucratic organization were the very same people who were saying, and leaving will be incredibly easy. Uh, and of course, they proved to be right in their first claim, but not in their second. Leaving the European Union as this audience more than any, any other, but anyone who understands the European Union knows was always going to be difficult. And, you know, if you think about the things we had to sort out, which isn't just the future relationship, but the question of money and debts, the question of citizens' rights, all those things were going to be difficult. They were made even more difficult by Article 50, which, uh, I mean, one of the lessons of Brexit is that Article 50 should put you off trying to leave even if, even if you really want to, because it's an absurd process to squeeze all this into two years and to deal with the past without dealing with the future is problematic in all sorts of ways. And actually, uh, it also hints Article 50 at something I'm going to talk about at length later on, which is that the constitutional arrangements in place within any state that is trying to leave are going to be fundamental to this process. And the UK constitution is, well, let's just say unique for the moment. Actually, in retrospect, the divorce issues around Brexit were sorted out remarkably quickly and easily. Uh, I, for one, thought that we would be haggling for months, if not years, over money. In the end, it took a few weeks. I was incredibly impressed by how quickly both sides came to an agreement on citizens' rights. And actually, if you consider the arguments going on over the Northern Ireland Protocol, it's quite remarkable that the European Court's role in adjudicating over citizens' rights is not mentioned politically in the United Kingdom at all. So actually, those outstanding issues were sorted out a lot quicker than I would have thought. But of course, another layer to Brexit on top of all of this, and I'll come back to Northern Ireland in more detail later, because that obviously was... The sticking point. The other layer to this is how you adapt your own state machinery to the requirements of leaving the European Union proved to be an enormous headache. I think by the start of 2020, we had around 25,000 civil servants working on Brexit. 
uh, that was just how complicated it was. I remember in sort of 2016, early 2017, I went to see David Lidington, who was then uh, leader of the House of Commons. And he was sitting in his very fine office, the leader of the house gets a very fine office next to the chamber. And he had this enormous whiteboard in his office with a list of things. And I said, oh, what's that? And he said, these are the things we keep remembering we have to do because we're leaving the European Union that we'd forgotten about. So, you know, on the list was we need our own legal provisions for imposing sanctions on third countries because absent EU membership, there is no legal provision under, under UK law. And that was a sort of a nice little sort of sort of insight into the massive complexities of this. Again, if you want, the Brexiters were right. This thing had in infiltrated every aspect of our domestic, political and economic life. And we had to make that good. Filling the legal black holes left by Brexit, the, the legislative mess that was Parliament's attempts to deal with fisheries, with agriculture, with immigration, uh, all at the same time, with trade, uh, trying to put in place the legislation that would give us both new laws and legal powers to do what the European Union did for us. Uh, and I think one of the lessons of Brexit, which we've learned, or which other countries have learned, is, you know, you want to think long and hard before you emulate the United Kingdom, because this process was so messy, so complicated, and so problematic in so many different ways. Now, Brexit would have been hard under any circumstances. Uh, we could have had the most talented prime minister in the world, enjoying the largest parliamentary majority ever seen, and this would have been a challenging thing. Of course, we had neither. Uh, you could argue in retrospect that actually Theresa May was a uniquely bad prime minister to have in place for several reasons, not all of them connected to her character or leadership. She had been a Remainer, and that was to prove absolutely fundamental during this process, because having been a Remainer, she spent most of her first year feeling the need to prove her pro-Brexit credentials to the <laughs> Brexit ultras in the Conservative Party. Very good. So that Conservative Party conference in 2016, where she made that speech about her red lines, the Lancaster House speech, were partly at least her trying to prove her bona fides as a reformed Remainer to the people in her party who suspected that actually she wasn't one of them. The second thing about Theresa May that we don't talk about enough that I think was absolutely fundamental to the Brexit process is she didn't have to go through a full leadership process. If you remember, everyone else in the Tory leadership contest dropped out. So she was, she was anointed very, very quickly indeed. And this meant two things. It meant, firstly, she never had to spell out what she thought Brexit meant. And in fact, famously, if you think back, her claim was Brexit means Brexit. That was it. Uh, so she never had to spell out a vision and she never had to get that vision approved in a vote by MPs and by party members. I suspect that if she'd had to spell out a vision and if the party members had voted for it and if MPs had voted for it, she would have spared herself a lot of the problems she had in Parliament going forward because her approach would have enjoyed a legitimacy that it otherwise lacked. But of course, some of the problems were inherent in the referendum process itself. We had a referendum in which we had a choice between leave and remain. As Michel Barnier was fond of reminding us, it wasn't quite that simple. And it wasn't quite that simple because of course, leave is comprised of many potential options ranging from Norway all the way down to uh, Canada. And, tr and trying to figure out the, the, the problems of a binary referendum leading to multiple potential choices thereafter was one of the crucial problems that we faced. I mean, for those of an economic bent, you know, we're talking here about the Condorcet paradox, where you have several options to choose from, and it is very, very difficult to build a legitimate majority for, am I doing something wrong on the screen? Okay, all right, uh, for any of them. Now, this is all made far, far worse and far more acute by the fact that the UK was divided down the middle when it came to Brexit. You all know that the referendum was 52-48, but those divisions went far, far further than that. <coughs> so as early as July 2017, so straight af uh, after that election that she called and lost, Theresa May is having to publicly ask her cabinet to stop leaking discussions. By the summer of 2017, the Treasury was refusing to give 
its forecast for the economic effects of Brexit to the cabinet because they didn't trust the cabinet. Uh, to put it more graphically, this is the scale of government resignations under Theresa May compared to under other prime ministers. What you have is a government that is profoundly divided over Brexit. Now, you could have lived with that if you had a parliament that was willing to come together to agree on some sort of Brexit outcome. But of course, the British Parliament wasn't able to do this. And there are several things that are interesting about this. The first is the deal that Theresa May ultimately negotiated with the European Union was to all intents and purposes, the very deal that Jeremy Corbyn had been calling for. It was a deal with something that looked like a customs union. It was a deal with the potential for alignment with single market rules. It was a deal that left the door open for UK membership in EU agencies. Ultimately, however, even those Labour MPs who came from Leave constituencies and had said that they would vote in favour of leaving the European Union did not support Theresa May's deal because politics took priority over Brexit. That is to say, bringing down a Conservative Prime Minister was far more important to them ultimately, or not being seen to support a Conservative Prime Minister was more important to them ultimately than getting a softer form of Brexit through Parliament. So many of those same MPs who refused to back the May deal on the basis that it was too hard a Brexit, ironically enough, went on to vote for the Boris Johnson deal that of course was a far more distant relationship with the EU than that which Theresa May had. Uh, negotiated. And the problem to show it graphically was this. These are the so-called meaningful votes that were held in the House of Commons on the 1st of April 2019. And what you will find is you have a parliament that can only agree to disagree. There is absolutely no Brexit outcome out of that whole suite of potential Brexit outcomes over which you can build a parliamentary majority. And as a consequence, uh, with the so-called meaningful votes in the early part of 2019, the government suffers the biggest defeat for over 100 years in the House of Commons. She goes away, she comes back with the deal and suffers the fourth biggest defeat that any government has suffered in the age of universal suffrage. And that is the reason why, quite simply, the Parliament could only agree to disagree. Now, there was a lot of talk at the time. Uh, Matt's cartoons are one of the best things about Brexit. Incidentally, there was a lot of talk at the time about the fact that Parliament was letting the British people down, that Parliament was sort of failing the people because it was unable to come to a majority verdict over Brexit. The fact of the matter is that Parliament was performing its representative function perfectly. This is some polling uh, that was done in 2019. And what it shows is that the British public was as racked by the sort of Condorcet paradox as Parliament was. There were a lot of options and you simply could not build a stable majority for any of them. So one of the lessons about Brexit, and it's something I'll come back to towards the end of this lecture, is it polarised us. It polarised us as a country and there was no settled majority for anything, which meant that it was kind of inevitable that a majority of people were going to emerge from the process unhappy that they didn't get what they wanted, which is precisely, in a sense, where the UK is at the moment. More substantively, I think the other really crucial element of the negotiations and of the lessons we've learned is that we are a very, very complex country in constitutional terms. And those complexities have been rendered even more complex as a result of Brexit. So let me start with Northern Ireland. There's good old Arlene. Uh, Brexit confronted Northern Ireland with a huge number of basically unpalatable options. Uh, unpalatable for the DUP because of course they'd back Brexit, they wanted a hard Brexit. Uh, they didn't want a separation between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. They didn't want the compromise that Theresa May's deal represented. Uh, this all boils down to what has come to be known as the Northern Ireland trilemma, okay? Uh, and the Northern Ireland trilemma, quite simply, is you can have any two of those three things, but you can't have all three of them. So the UK can leave the single market and the customs union, uh, and you can have a whole UK Brexit. That's to say the whole of the UK leaves. But then you would have to have a border on the island of Ireland. 
if the whole of the UK is outside the single market in the customs union, there is a customs and regulatory border down the middle of the island of Ireland. If you leave the single market and the customs union and want to prevent that border, then you can't have a whole UK Brexit. This is, if you like, the Boris Johnson deal, which is Northern Ireland remains under some of the rules of the single market. There is a border, a trade and regulate and regulatory, a customs and regulatory border between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. And that is the subject of the fight at the moment between uh, the UK government and the European Union. It is something explicitly that the UK government signed up to. Uh, or you can stay within parts of the single market and the customs union, in which case the whole of the UK can leave on the same terms and you can avoid that border within uh, the island of Ireland, which is what Theresa May ultimately offered us. The Theresa May Northern Ireland backstop ultimately offered a mitigated version of the line on the top, leaving the single market and the customs union, which allowed you to achieve the other two objectives. But you couldn't, and this still haunts us to this day, you cannot achieve all three of those uh, requirements simultaneously. Now, as a result, the protocol has become a massive issue in Northern Ireland politics. More generally, the whole devolution settlement in the United Kingdom has been unpicked. And one of the reasons why it's been unpicked is, even though we didn't realize it as, at the time, Devolution in the United Kingdom rested on the assumption that the UK was a member state of the single market and the customs union because that avoided the appearance of regulatory borders within the UK's own single market. A second problem was no one in the civil service was actually aware of this. It turned out that we had a massive lack of expertise within our own administration about how our country functioned because we took it all for granted because it was all neatly solved by EU membership. And one of the, on top of the practical problems generated by Brexit, there was the fact that the British government's approach to post-Brexit devolution was to basically impose solutions on the other governments within the United Kingdom. Uh, we can talk in questions if you want about the internal market bill and uh, things like this. Now, this has political implications. If we look at this, this is the polling, the tracking polling on support for Scottish independence. You have that period from uh, 2019 onwards when yes opens up a lead over no in the polls. What you have is a, is, is, is a slight surge in support for independence as a result both of Brexit and of the way in which the British government was perceived to have been pursuing Brexit against the interests of Scotland, as it was seen in Scotland. The reason why the gap in the polls has closed is quite interesting. What you've had in Scotland essentially since the referendum is a sort of recasting of the political divide. The people who support Remain have increasingly come to support independence because independence is a way of rejoining the European Union. But the reason the gap has closed is that people who supported Brexit have increasingly come to oppose independence because they see independence as forcing them back into the European Union that they wanted to leave. So the yes remain and no leave camps have now kind of solidified in Scottish public opinion, which means there's no clear and obvious majority for independence now. Uh, the other thing I would say is whilst there's been an impact on public opinion, the practical arguments for Scottish independence have also been changed quite profoundly by Brexit, because the fact that the United Kingdom or Great Britain is outside the single market and the customs union means that if Scotland leaves the United Kingdom and joins the European Union, there will have to be that customs and regulatory border between Scotland and England. And I suspect that if it comes to a referendum, that might be quite a hard sell uh, for the SNP. And of course, the SNP is meant to be passing legislation for a referendum at some point this year, uh, at which point you can expect, I imagine, a Supreme Court case and a lot of building tension between Edinburgh and London. Now, it's not only in Scotland where public opinion has been shifting as a result of Brexit. Uh, what this shows is on the one hand, the attitude of MPs towards the Northern Ireland Protocol. On the other hand, the attitude of the Northern Ireland public 
towards Northern Ireland Protocol. And what you will notice is the Northern Ireland public is far more positive about the protocol than MPs in Westminster of either party. And actually, Katie Haywood of Queen's University Belfast and David Finnemore have just got some recent polling, which they presented uh, on Monday, which you'll be able to find on their website, which reaffirms this, that actually for all the talk, particularly by David Frost of a crisis in Northern Ireland because of the protocol, the reality was actually that people in Northern Ireland could live pretty easily with the protocol and we're starting to see the benefits of it. And one of the reasons I think that people in Northern Ireland were starting to see the benefits of the protocol was it had an economic impact. These were the charts the UK government used in September and October last year when they were mapping the ongoing fuel crisis in the UK. You think in September and October last year, many parts of the United Kingdom, I live in Oxford, Oxford completely ran out of petrol. You could not buy petrol anywhere, okay? The only part of the United Kingdom that was not affected by petrol shortages, as you will see from that uh, map, was Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland is the one part of the United Kingdom that remained part of the single market. Uh, my suspicion, I have no evidence for this whatsoever, but what my suspicion was that one of the reasons why David Frost was so keen to renegotiate the protocol or to scrap it altogether was that actually, for all the difficulties that I'll come to later on in this talk about judging the economic impacts of Brexit, one very clear way of judging the economic impact of Brexit would be to compare Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Because the only variable there is a differential relationship with the single market and the customs union. And you see that there. So actually, for some people in Northern Ireland, the protocol has worked quite well. And increasingly for businesses in Northern Ireland that are perfectly happy trading with the Republic if that's replacing trade with Great Britain, uh, they are starting to see what actually Theresa, what actually the government should have done when it sold the protocol to British businesses is to say, look, you have the best of both worlds. You have unfettered access to the Great British market, to the Great Britain market from Northern Ireland. You also have unfettered access to the EU market. You are in a unique position in the whole of Europe in this sense. And there are opportunities here for businesses. However, what has happened is as a result of the fights over the protocol, you get this, you get a draining of faith in Northern Ireland in the UK government. Now, this does not translate easily over into someone saying, oh, wow, there's loads of support now for a border poll in the United Ireland. But there's a nudge in that direction if you look at the polling. There is greater support now for a border poll than there was pre-referendum in 2016. And those levels of dissatisfaction with the UK government are going to have profound consequences. In May of this year, we have elections in the United Kingdom, including elections uh, for Stormont. The polling suggests that Sinn Féin might come out of those elections as the biggest party in Northern Ireland. Uh, I'll just let those words sink in. That has such profound implications for Northern Ireland and for the United Kingdom. And there is every possibility looking at the polling now that the DUP will be down in third or fourth place. So there's a complete sea change in the politics of Northern Ireland. It's not all down to Brexit. I should make that absolutely clear. There are a whole lot of other factors at play here, but Brexit was certainly one of the reasons and Brexit is having this impact of unsettling the sort of territorial politics of the UK. Brexit is also unsettling our constitutional politics more broadly. Uh, one of the things that we didn't really talk about, one of the many things we didn't talk about at the time of the referendum, that perhaps we should have talked about at the time of the referendum, was that Brexit would fundamentally alter our constitutional slash legal system. In the UK, we don't have very easy mechanisms for having constitutional or quasi-constitutional law that is beyond the reach of a simple parliamentary majority. We can't enshrine rights or uh, obligations out of the reach of parliament because of the principle of parliamentary sovereignty. Parliament can overturn things with a simple majority. That wasn't true when we were members of the European Union because rights were enshrined in EU law which obviously meant that the UK parliament alone could not change those rights. We've lost that now. We no longer have the provision to do that. And that whole relationship between politics and courts, between the law and politics, has, is now up for negotiation. The government is approaching it from the point of view of restricting the role of courts, from limiting the scope for judicial review, for limiting 
the scope of the Human Rights Act. There are reviews underway on both fronts now from the government. But the nature of our system, the way it works, the relative power of executive, of parliament and of the courts is something that is shifting as a result of our departure from the European Union. And it's shifting, sadly, without the proper debate that there really should be about something that is quite so profound. So if you look, for instance, at one of the interesting debates for the months and years to come, the government wants to find a rather a fast tracked way of changing retained EU law. So all that EU law that is on our statute books now from our time as an EU member state, the government wants to find a fast track way of changing or repealing it. Fast track means without full parliamentary scrutiny. Uh, that's fine. That might be legitimate if you're a government minister. There might be people in parliament who think it's less legitimate. But the danger at the moment is this looks like it's going to be done without the sort of debate about what sort of constitution we want, where power should reside, who gets to choose, that actually I suspect is, is pretty much a necessity for, for decisions of this scale and magnitude. Okay, so I'm going to move on from one thing I know nothing about, which is law, to another thing I know nothing about, which is economics. Uh, and I want to talk briefly about what we've learned about economics as a result of the Brexit process. Well, we've learned that David Davis was wrong. We can say that without uh, too much danger of being contradicted. The idea that we could simply continue trading with the European Union as we did, because no one would want to lose that trade with us. Uh, it was interesting, actually, because I remember... I did a radio program for Radio 4 at the early point of the Brexit negotiations. And as part of it, we went to Berlin and talked to business representatives in Berlin about whether they were putting pressure on the government to, you know, make concessions to allow the UK to cherry pick, to keep them within the single market, even if they didn't have freedom of movement or whatever. And of course, what one of the people there said was, uh, actually, no, because this is politics. This is like sanctions on Russia. He said, you know, we like trading with Russia, we would continue trading with Russia, but if the government takes a stand that because of politics, we have to have sanctions on Russia, we don't argue against that. We simply make do, we simply adapt. And that is what we will do with Brexit, uh, which turned out to be the case, that actually the government took a political line and EU government took a political line and David Davis's expectations were sadly dashed. So we went from that to this, I've talked before about how politically toxic the Treasury forecasts about Brexit were. They've still not been officially released. We've still got, and I'll show you a slide in a minute, uh, which is basically a photocopy of a leak that BuzzFeed got hold of in 2017, which is the best we've got. Uh, now, let me talk you through the economics a little bit. Firstly, this, this is work by John Springford at the Centre for European Reform. And what he's done is he basically takes a basket of, car of currencies that have served in the past as a good doppelganger for the UK economy and extrapolates forward from the referendum of 2016, how that basket of currencies has performed versus how the UK has performed. And you see that gap at the end. The important thing to note about that gap at the end is it has appeared significantly before the UK actually left the European Union. Okay, and there's an argument going on about why that might be the case. On the UK and a Changing Europe website, we've got a fantastic working paper by Thomas Sampson and Swati Dingra from <coughs> the LSE, who basically argue, they say that by 2019, there's a gap of about 2% between where you'd expect the UK economy to be and where it actually was because of Brexit. Their argument is it's largely because of devaluation of the pound. Uh, you can read the paper and make up your own mind. Uh, but the combination of John's work and their work points to the fact that A, devaluation has a massive impact. B, what you essentially have is an investment strike because CEOs not unreasonably decide that they're not willing to pump millions of pounds into the UK economy until they know what its terms of trade are with its nearest and largest trading partner. So Brexit has an impact on the UK economy even before we leave the European Union. This is the process when we're sort of trying to figure out what it all means. And, you know, I remember having a conversation with someone senior in the Confederation of British Industry who was saying, well, this morning we had a seminar with some of our leading CEOs and they were tearing their hair out because half of them realized for the first time that they had European supply chains. Because again, this is one of the things they just took for granted. They never had to worry about it when we were a member of the European Union. All of a sudden they were facing the prospect of those supply chains 
getting disrupted and we're desperately trying to get on the phone to the Treasury and say, hang on a sec, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? So there was a very, very steep learning curve for a lot of people in the immediate aftermath of the referendum. And then we have the economic forecast. This is some forecasts that we did in uh, collaboration with the LSE. What you'll see is the Office for Budget Responsibility comes up with a minus 4% figure. I think the National Institute of Economic uh, Research comes out with a figure of about 7%. I mean, it depends on your assumptions. We use a productivity assumption in this, which makes our impact larger than the OBR's uh, impact would be. The fact of the matter is across the board, economic forecasts point to a range of between four and let's say 7% of negative impact on the UK economy over a period of 10 to 15 years, okay? That is huge, that is huge by any measure. I mean, I'll come back in a minute to talk about the fact that it might be huge, but it might not be as politically salient as you'd assume it would be, but it's a big figure. One of the reasons I think why the impact of leaving on perceptions in the UK hasn't been as big as you might have assumed. It's partly because of John Springford's work. The reason why we haven't faced the cliff edge that Remainers predicted is we were halfway down that cliff edge before we'd actually left, that we'd, we'd started slithering down already and had felt some of the effects, which actually paradoxically meant that the effect of actually leaving the single market in the customs union was slightly cushioned. And it was partly cushioned, of course, by COVID as well, which I'll come back to. The government in that sense was quite lucky that the economic impacts of Brexit at the time of departure were absolutely hidden by the economic impacts of the pandemic. Now, it's worth just pausing for a moment to think about where those impacts come from. This is the photocopy. You see, it's a slightly grubby piece of paper of the Treasury forecasts. Uh, and it's worth looking at that diagonal blue bit under the line, which is non-tariff barriers. British ministers have a habit of banging on about tariffs as if removing tariffs led to free trade and made trade easier. The fundamental obstacle to trade are non-tariff barriers. Uh, bear in mind that the UK has not yet put in place all the non-tariff barriers that it needs to for trade with the European Union. The next significant tranche are only going to be put in place in July with the introduction of veterinary and SBS checks which will have a massive impact on trade across the channel. The other thing to look at in this chart that I think is revealing is above the line, there are two things. There is a tiny black line above the line, which is the Treasury's estimate of the net, net economic benefits of regulatory independence. That is to say, you know, if we regulate by ourselves really well, specifically for UK conditions, we can earn that much which you don't need me to point this out, is quite small compared to the impact of non-tariff barriers. The second thing above the line, which is equally striking, is the Treasury's assessment of the net economic benefits of us signing free trade deals with every single one of those countries listed underneath. Okay, so if the UK government goes out and signs trade deals with all those countries, and there are good reasons to do so, and there are foreign policy reasons to do so, and the new British government's foreign policy is using trade as one of its tools, and it's very, very sensible indeed. But the ultimate gains are not really going to be economic, as that shows. That the economics of signing trade deals, even with China or with India or whoever, are negligible compared to the negative impacts of having left the European Union. And this is what's happened so far. Uh, that trade is already starting to be hit. The, the data is very, very, very messy. I reckon we need to give it about another year before we get a, a degree of clarity because of course there's still a COVID impact. Uh, you know, I, you think about service providers who aren't traveling to European countries. I mean, I've got a couple of colleagues who canceled trips to Bruges because uh, the College of Europe couldn't figure out which paperwork they had to sign to come and get paid for providing courses. So there's, there's sort of, initial learning going on as people come out of the pandemic. But there is no doubt that there has been an impact on imports and exports already. That will become more marked as the UK government introduces the full gamut of checks. And just in terms of a comparison, uh, that is the comparison between the medium term impact of COVID and the medium term impact, which is the green line of Brexit with the kind of free trade agreement that we now have. Uh, that COVID might have blotted out the impact of Brexit in the short term for very understandable reasons, but over the medium term, 
Brexit is going to have a far larger impact on the UK economy, two, three times as big. I want to turn briefly now to the politics of all this uh, and just explain a little bit about the politics and maybe sort of ruminate a little bit about where they might be going. The first thing is that the Brexit divide in the United Kingdom is a values division. It's not a left-right division. And this graph shows the correlation quite clearly. The correlation is between whether you're a social liberal or a social conservative and how you voted in the referendum. And when, when the polling companies do the sort of the, the values thing, they're asking questions like, do you support the death penalty? Should children be disciplined more severely in school? Gender equality, gay rights, all those sorts of things are the triggering. Now, the next slide is probably an absolute waste of time given the international nature of this audience. But for any of you who happen to be, there is a TV program on BBC called Mrs. Brown's Boys which is about a working class family in Liverpool, and it polarizes the UK public like nothing else. Whether you like Mrs. Brown's boys or not is a very strong predictor about how you voted in the Brexit referendum. Uh, this is by means of showing that this isn't an economic, this is cultural in a very sort of intangible, if you're English, you will get this immediately. It's one of those things where you can just say, oh yeah, that makes perfect sense. You know, I know the people I know who hate Mrs. Brown boys. No one is, no, virtually no one is kind of easy about Mrs. Brown boys. You either love it or you loathe it. There's no, there's no sort of middle ground about it. But this is just by means of showing that this is a cultural thing. Uh, that, that, that shapes how we, we shape, it's shaped by our worldviews rather than our economic preferences. Just to try and desperately look relevant in these times, there is a shift in our perceptions of foreign policy going on at the moment. Uh, the European Union is now seen as a, as a less key partner than the United States, which wasn't the case necessarily for public opinion pre-Brexit. But the most interesting slide is the next slide, which shows that this goes by essentially your uh, Brexit preference, because the Conservatives are essentially a Brexit party now. And you can see that, you know, worldviews in terms of who we should be working with and why. Brexit is eking into every aspect of our public policy and shaping people's perceptions of every part of our public policy. Things are seen through a Brexit lens. Brexit identities, and I'll come back to this very, very briefly at the end, are very, very strong and very, very sticky in the United Kingdom. And those identities are becoming a lens through which people view the world. There is also, however, an economic element to Brexit. That is the map of Leave versus Remain. Uh, so, in, uh, towards the end of 2019, uh, Rory Stewart left Parliament and decided to stand as Mayor of London. Okay, is, you'll see the point of this, I hope, this story. And during his campaign for Mayor of London, uh, at one point he was interviewed by someone who asked him, what's your favourite pub in London? Okay, and Rory, being Rory, and Rory's a bit odd, said Pret which clearly isn't the pub, but apparently was his favorite pub. Now, the next interesting thing that happened after Rory said Pret was he was absolutely assaulted on Twitter by Corbynistas accusing him of being a liberal metropolitan, you know, loser because he liked Pret. I remember going into the office the next day and our office, everyone's in their twenties and saying, what the hell is all this about? Could you figure it out? And so our office went off and did a bit of work and came up with this. They, they are the locations of all the Prets in England. And what you'll see is that an uncanny correlation between Pretland and Remainland, because it turns out that Pret is a place inhabited by liberal metropolitan young people, as a rule, and it tends to base itself in the more prosper prosperous parts of the United Kingdom. Okay, to put this in a more serious way, that is the relationship between average median weekly wages and your probability of voting leave in the referendum. So yes, this was a values divide. And yes, age and your level of education are by far the best predictors of how you voted in the referendum. But there's an economic dimension to this as well, in the sense that if you lived in a part of the country that wasn't doing well economically, you were proportionally more likely to vote for leave, even given educational level, age, and the rest of it. 
One of the really interesting things we've learned from Brexit is we've learned about these economic inequalities. Uh, one of the really striking things about the British political debate post-referendum is how even the Conservative Party now gives the impression of being obsessed with inter-regional inequality. And of course, they have every reason to be obsessed with inter-regional inequality, because when it comes to inter-regional inequality, we win by a mile. Uh, but Brexit has shifted how our politics works. And actually, it's one of the points I'm very, very important. It's very, very important to make. I've been through all those slides about aggregate economic impacts of Brexit, and they're absolutely right. The British economy is going to be less big than it would have been within the single market and the customs union as a result of Brexit. It is conceivable, however, that because of the political impact that referendum had. And because of the way it shifted our political discourse around equality and particularly geographical inequality, that the UK might end up being a smaller but less unequal economy than it would have been had we remained within the European Union. You will still hear people say, oh, those people up in the north of England, they'll get their comeuppance because Brexit's going to make them poorer. Possibly. But actually, the government is starting to invest in some of those places that haven't seen government investment for three or four decades. It is conceivable. And, you know, there are a lot of riders around this, one of which is the competence of the current government, quite obviously, that we will start doing things different, that actually public money will be invested in places that haven't seen public money for a long, 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 long time. And the nature of our economy and the distributive elements of that economy are going to start changing quite profoundly. So watch this space. To round off, I mean, ignore this bit because it will all be wrong. But OK, so that's where we are on Brexit. And essentially, and I know there are people who want to say, oh, look, there are loads more people now who think it was wrong than right. We're divided down the middle. Insofar as that change has taken place with that green line sort of getting on top of the blue line, all the evidence we have suggests that this has nothing at all to do with Leave voters changing their minds. No one is changing their minds virtually over Brexit at the moment. It's an identity thing, Brexit. That change has come about because of demographic, demographic churn. Given what I said about age, leavers are dying and young people are entering the electorate who are disproportionately likely to be remainers. I mean, that is the best explanation we can give for why we're having that trend in British public opinion at the moment. At the same time, I suppose encouragingly for people like me who work on Brexit, there is no sign whatsoever that the Brexit divide is going away. I mean, there's been a slight weakening. If you go to our website, we put out a report last week on politics and public opinion post-Brexit. And there are some fantastic pieces by uh, well, John Curtis, uh, Sarah Hobolt, and a number of people looking at various aspects of public opinion. And what they show is far more people in the United Kingdom identify themselves as a Lever or a Remainer than identify as Labour or Conservative. So despite the fact that, you know, we've left, the referendum's out of the way, these Brexit identities still continue to haunt our politics. And as we saw with the foreign policy slides, those identities shape how we see the world outside. The one thing that is changing that is quite interesting and might have implications for our politics going forward <clears throat> is that there is an increasing number of people who think Brexit is being handled very, very badly indeed. And one of the big shifts we've seen in recent times, interestingly enough, is that I think according to John Curtis's numbers, about 20% of the leavers who backed Boris Johnson in the general election of 2019 now intend to vote for another party. And that's fundamental because Boris Johnson's massive achievement in December 2019 was essentially to build a leave coalition. 75% of Leave voters voted Conservative. The Conservatives became the party of Leave in December 2019. And if that coalition is crumbling, partly because of competence worries, and you're seeing Leave voters start to leave the Conservative Party, that has potentially significant uh, implications for politics going forward. And remember uh, that when YouGov did a poll for the first time in October last year that showed a majority of Leave supporters disapproved of Boris Johnson's performance as Prime Minister. That predated Partygate 
and the recent scandal. So that trend was happening even despite the scandals that the government is seeing. And one of the things I think we need to watch out for in British politics going forward is not that Brexit disappears, but that Brexit becomes recast as an economic issue. This is the Ipsos salience tracker, which, which issues are of most salience to the British people. My guess would be over the next four months, you'll see the economy rise. Well, you've got war as well now, but the economy will rise in salience as the cost of living crisis starts to hit home. And one of the interesting things, given that previous slide about Brexit being handled badly, is the degree to which the Labour Party are successful in casting Brexit as an economics rather than a, as a values issue. Whether or not, in other words, Labour can force the political debate onto the traditional left-right terrain, terrain on which the Conservative Party is appallingly badly divided because it's put together this cross-class pro-Brexit coalition. So the question for Brexit going forward is not whether it remains an issue or not. It will remain an issue in our politics for the foreseeable future. It will remain an issue in British politics quite simply because we are parked next to a continental-sized economy and we have no choice but to keep worrying about it and thinking about it and talking about it. But how Brexit is framed, whether it's framed as by the government in culture war terms or it's framed as by Rachel Reeves, who's the shadow chancellor, as an economic mistake by the government, I think is going to fundamentally determine how it plays out in our politics going forward. That's 50 minutes, which is what I promised. So I shall stop there. Sorry, Anand, that was terrific. I'm, I don't know if you want to stop sharing your slides right now so people can see your lovely face instead. Um, we, do have, we do have about 40 minutes for questions from the audience. That includes those of you in Zoom land. If you want to ask a question um, from Zoom, please do post it in the chat. Um, and we'll make sure to, to bring that into the conversation. I did have one question while people are thinking about what they wanna ask in on, uh, and that relates to the slide where you showed us the, the percentage of people that were, were thinking about leave and the percentage of people that were thinking about remain. Um, and, and there was this solid block of about 15 to 20% of people who were undecided about whether leave or remain was a good idea. and and. How can these people not take a stand after so long? I mean, they, they seem remarkably consistent in trying to be indifferent toward this issue, uh, which has otherwise polarized the country. So if you could talk about those people a little bit, I'd be curious. It's partly people who didn't vote, who feel reluctant to sort of get involved in this now. Uh, but there are some people who just, you know, I know people who will just say, I'm not talking about Brexit. Just not talking about it, because that way lies ruin. You know, that way lies divided families, fights in the pub. Uh, I'm staying out of it. I don't want to get involved in that debate. There is a little bit of that going around. Doesn't mean they haven't made up their minds. It just means that they won't respond to pollsters. But you're right, it has been consistent all the way through. And it is a curiosity. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for such a stimulating lecture. My name is Michael with the Robert Schuman Center. Just uh, two questions. One is, when you referred to COVID, it seemed to me that you only cast it, you only framed it as something that was kind of saving the government's blushes, that it was hiding, you know, a very a situation that would have been worse. But couldn't we at least wait and see? I mean, it could have been making things more difficult for the British economy, surely, mm -hmm. so that there could be a positive side to, you, you seem to have only stressed sort of the, the, the fact that the masking effect yeah. of, of COVID. So about that. And then the second point I have is, you know, you've outlined so well about how the process has been, you didn't say nightmare, but let's, you know, it's so incredibly difficult getting out. And, you know, the, the EU is a very long established project, highly revered. You know, I've heard Peter Sutherland, the late, you know, an Irish commissioner, like it's, the greatest thing in a thousand years like okay so then i'm asking a bit like galileo you know uh, brexit happened you know yet it happened so you know so we've got like it's been a nightmare since it was highly lauded but yet it took place so why yeah i mean there are there are, there are layers of answer to the second question uh and actually i think there needs to be a bit more reflection inside the European Union about how and why 
Brexit happened than there has been, I would say. But anyway, we'll leave that to one side. But I mean, obviously, part of the reason is the UK was different to other member states. Uh, and the UK was different in several uh, salient ways, I think. We were quite a big member state. We're, you know, very, very proud of our history, which makes us different. I mean, small states have a whole different calculation when it comes to, say, if you think about Peter Sutherland, the Irish debate is obviously very, very different to the UK debate. We're not in the Euro, which makes leaving far more easy to think. I mean, you know, if you think Brexit was a nightmare, imagine doing Brexit if you're in the Euro as well. Uh, but I think most fundamentally was the fact that, and, you know, it's a good audience to correct me if I'm totally wrong. Brexit, I mean, EU membership didn't enter the political DNA of the United Kingdom in the way that it did other member states. And I think one of the reasons for that, uh, and just you know, by way of illustration, I mean, the French don't need lessons from the UK when it comes to nationalism, but the French president sits in front of two flags when he talks to the French people. It's just inconceivable in the United Kingdom. Uh, and I think one of the reasons for that, if not the main reason for that, is we've never really had a political story about European integration in the United Kingdom. So if you think about the original six, it's economic integration to prevent war. When you think about the countries of Southern Europe, it's economic integration as turning your back on a period of dictatorship. You think about the countries of Eastern Europe and, you know, economic integration is a means to a political end. For us, economic integration was a means to an economic end. Uh, and I think that meant that the glue that held us in was, was, was less sticky in some ways than it was uh, for other member states. So I think, you know, it, yes, there are interesting questions to be asked about how is it that elites are so enamored of the European Union and yet when you ask the public, they are far less so, uh, that need to be thought about and reflected on. But I also think you need to take account of the fact that we're slightly odd as, as, a, as a country. Now on COVID, you're right. Uh, I should have said for now, I think up to this point, uh, if you ask people what is responsible for the cost of living, they'll say COVID. What's responsible for economic problems? COVID. And far fewer people will say Brexit. Six months time, those problems are persisting. And particularly, I mean, this is the difficulty, isn't it? Is, you know, why isn't this hitting home politically? It isn't hitting home politically because it's slow burn, because it's quite subtle. Because actually, one of the reasons why Brexit isn't hitting home is because our retailers are utterly fantastic at dealing with supply chain problems. I mean, I've spent quite a lot of time in the last three or four years talking to people who work in the supply chains for supermarkets. And those people are just superheroes. I mean, they're planning, they're logistical. I mean, you listen to the planning that they did for No Deal and stuff to make sure that, you know, you can still get your creme brulee in Marks and Spencers, regardless of the fact that you couldn't import it anymore. And they were stockpiling. You could not get warehousing space in the UK towards the end of 2019 because the supermarkets have bought it all. So it's partly that we just happen to have very, very good operators who deal with this. But you're absolutely right. The longer we look to be suffering economically, particularly if that looks to be the case in comparison with continental Europe, which is a big if, but if that happens, the harder it is to say, yeah, that's a global pandemic. But you'll, you know, Boris Johnson now will say, there is a global cost of living crisis. But obviously, obviously Brexit is part of that. Brexit is part of that because it contributes to the labor shortages we're experiencing, particularly in the southeast of the country. And Brexit is part of that because it's making it more expensive to trade, which is going to feed into the inflation figures. It's just very, very hard to disentangle it, which means that politically, for the moment, its salience is just a little bit limited, I think. Uh, thanks, Anon, for a very comprehensive <coughs> lecture. You've answered pretty much every question I had. Uh, two thoughts still in mind. Uh, the first one, how do you look back as referenda as a political instrument? Second, um, you've talked a lot about the UK. Can you also say a few things about what's the current sentiment in Brussels? What do they see as the major stumble blocks that are still open um, you know, going to, you know, towards the future? I think, I mean, my simple answer to your first question is blunt. This referendum as a political instrument. Uh, blunt but unavoidable is the second part. I think, you know, referendums have become part of our political life now. And 
there are all sorts of ways in which you could and perhaps should improve upon the way referendums are done. The problem is that having done it in a certain way, it's quite hard to choose. So if you take the debate about the referendum in 2016, debate about the franchise, whether EU citizens should be allowed to vote, whether 16, 17 year olds should be able to vote, de uh, debates about the question, debates about whether you needed a supermajority. In a sense, they were all seen off by the argument that was a very convincing argument. Why the hell should we do this? And we didn't need to do it to join in the first place. But, but you know, we had, a, we had a referendum in 1975. We have to use the same rules for this referendum that we used then. Uh, so it's, there are all sorts of problems with referendums and all sorts of problems with the way we do referendums, but it is politically incredibly difficult to think about changing it. Uh, so I think we're, we're stuck with it. It'll be interesting to see the debate about uh, Scottish referendum. I mean, I, I personally don't like franchises being changed for the next vote. Because it's too, I mean, what, what the SNP did with the franchise in Scotland was they basically rigged it. They knew for a fact that 16 and 17 year olds are more likely to vote in favour of independence than older people. So they changed the franchise. And I don't, you know, that makes me very, very uncomfortable indeed. But, you know, all sorts of problems. I'm not sure how we deal with what, what Brussels is thinking. I mean, here, you know, what's going on in Ukraine will be important here because, I mean, for some people it means, well, look, you know, the, both sides will say, who cares about sausages in Northern Ireland because there's a war going on. Uh, and so we'll put aside our differences, come to a solution. I don't think that's going to happen. I think, nor, you know, normal service will resume. I don't know when. Uh, and I think, you know, for people in Brussels, rightly or wrongly, there are these are big legal questions of principles. You might laugh about it by saying it's sausages, but it's actually not sausages, it's the integrity of the single market. And you can't afford to compromise on that, not least because otherwise you might face some trader in France taking you to court, saying that actually, you know, you're in breach of your obligations here because you're not keeping these things out of the single market. I don't think there's much flexibility at the moment. I think there's too much distrust. What happens in Ukraine will be fundamental. There's no sign of the UK government softening its position towards the European Union during this crisis. We're very, very clear. We're working with, you know, the Baltic countries. We're working with Poland. We're working with NATO. What we're absolutely not doing is working with the European Union. I don't think I've heard a British government minister mention working with the European Union throughout this crisis. So the log jams remain. I mean, I think both sides, what I would like to see is both sides sort of sitting down and saying okay within a 10-year framework we are friends we are neighbors we are allies we face the same challenges and threats can we not between us figure out a way of creating a cooperative and collaborative relationship that works uh i think that will take time i think tempers have to cool i think the british government has to change uh but there are there are you know this this whole thing needs to be rethought down the line but i think my sense in brussels is there are still real suspicions and whilst obviously we're not going to raise those while there is a war going on in Europe but they're going to persist for a while. Thanks for a, a fascinating talk. I have a question regarding the lesson notion first. Uh, so the less those who should learn are we actually academics. What can we analyze in terms of mm -hmm. consequences implications? Not the political players, right? Or are there any beginnings of we need to call the radical dossier? Uh, problem, tragedy, um, that the political players are learning as well, the first point. My second point, um, <coughs> refer also to the binary question of a referendum. I mean, it was Mario Monti who always proposed to say, if you would say for each binary choice what the economic implications are, what would be as regards how the market can function in those cases, that would make people think, maybe, before they decide. And the third point I found very fascinating was you said about, you know, basically they say regarding economic inequality, regional inequality, both parties aim for the same thing, right? In, to some extent, right? Conservatives change at least. Uh, but that again doesn't change the view of Brexit at all because we then said this is just because we are next to the uh, to the European continent, and we will always be reminded of what the implications are of Brexit. Right? Therefore, it will never become weaker as an identification for time. And not even a conflict as we have now would make any difference. Go in reverse order. I don't know about those Brexit identities. I think if I think the best way to put that to the test would be a severe economic crisis. 
when the sort of left-right division comes back to the fore, and that's what we're arguing about. We're arguing about the size of the state, levels of taxation, levels of redistribution. Uh, because, you know, you have those two potential drivers of vote, voter choice, and the sort of social values one has led to very weird electoral outcomes. But one of the problems about those electoral outcomes, I think, is that you've created a conservative coalition that is dysfunctional when it comes to economic policy. You know, it's very, very hard to think of, a, of, a, of an economic program that this conservative government can follow that won't tear that coalition apart because you have the sort of former Labour seat MPs from the north of England who want greater investment, greater borrowing, a generous welfare state because that's what their constituents want. And you have traditional conservatives. Uh, and actually, that is the beauty of Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson is the only politician I can think of who, because of his complete and utter absence of firm, fixed political ideological principles, can hold that coalition together and convince both parts of the party that he's in it for them. It's an, I mean, it's an absolute genius gift. But actually, I think in the event that Boris Johnson goes, that division in the Conservative Party is going to become far, far more acute. So I think economics might be what undoes it, but I don't know. Uh, both parties, to an extent, yeah. I mean, you know, in 2017, it was very, very clear that the Conservative Party was parking its tanks on the Labour Party's wall. Uh, talking about inequality, talking about, you know, Theresa May just about managing the unfairness of society, why black kids or women don't have as good a chance. I mean, I remember reading an article in The Sun just before the 2017 election by Tim Montgomery, who's a sort of leading conservative commentator. I read it, I read it again, I read it three times. And I remember thinking I was completely and utterly discombobulated because I agreed with everything he said. All right, it was like, we need to, we need to raise taxation to invest more in the North, we need to help young I mean, it was basically a Labour manifesto but from a leading conservative thinker. So that, that, there has been a convergence, yes. I think on some of the details are less so, and I think the Conservative Party is far from united. On the economic implications, we need the economic implications. I mean, my God, the whole referendum campaign was one long economic forecast from the Remain side. The problem, three, three ways in which I think Leave voters were skeptical about those forecasts, okay? One was, we just don't believe you you're lying. Okay, that's the easy one. The second is, don't mind, we're willing to pay an economic price for that. But, you know, remember, a large chunk of the Leave vote weren't the working class from housing estates in Sunderland, it was comfortably off Conservative voters who will say we're comfortably off, we'll take a bit of an economic price to have our freedom back, to have the crown stamp on a pint glass. You know, I'm willing to pay for that. And the third lot were the ones who said, you know, 3% of GDP, so what? Even when you tell us GDP is going up 3%, our lives are rubbish. There is absolutely no correlation between your aggregate numbers and our life, which is a failing of communication and of economic policy by the sort of ancien regime, if you like. But there were a, a large number of people who just said, you know, whatever, you, whatever happens, you're not going to help us because you never have. So why don't we just take this opportunity to give you a poke in the eye and our lives will remain as rubbish as they were beforehand. And I think there was quite a, a significant strand of that. So I don't think it was that people hadn't seen the economic forecast. I think everyone, my God, we were so bored of the economic forecasts. But it was that people didn't necessarily, weren't necessarily convinced. Lessons for who? There are, I mean, there are lessons for academics. I remember when UK and the Changing Europe launched um, one of the first things we had to do was go out and find all the academic work that looks systematically at the costs and benefits of membership. And there really wasn't one. And there was a real, there was a lot of stuff that's saying, well, as we're members now, what shall we, you know, that sort of assumed membership and assumed that, you know, that was going to be the, the condition. But actually, there wasn't that much questioning, you know, uh, couldn't find articles on you know, is our budgetary payments and politics or whatever, but there wasn't that literature there. Do you want to ask I think there are lessons for politicians to learn. Uh, I wouldn't sort of presume to lecture them. I think most politicians have internalized a lot of the lessons, even if they won't talk about them publicly. Anyway, I was saying last night at dinner that we spent lots of time in sort of private rooms with politicians during the referendum campaign. 
when it became painfully aware. I mean, one of the, the, the structural problems with the way Brexit unfolded in Parliament was that the whip system collapsed because the parties, because the Brexit divide went through the parties. So you could no longer rely on the whip. So people had to make up their own decisions. When you make your own decisions, you have to suddenly find out stuff for yourself. Parliament, MPs don't have much in the way of research resources. So you found people making decisions on stuff they didn't understand. And so what we found in these meetings was people coming and saying, what's a customs union? Would that work? Does that mean free movement as well? Uh, I think politicians learned a lot of very, very painful lessons. I mean, for me, in a sense, this lecture was written for a kind of public audience more, more than uh, anything else. But I mean, if, if you said what are the things that academics should learn from this, I think that sort of the shift towards a value-based voter choice is something we should be spending a lot more time thinking about. And I think for economists, actually, the fundamental thing is, is that sort of transmission mechanism between the forecasts that we all know are based on pretty sound assumptions, because let's face it, no one's gone back and revisited their forecasts, and how you communicate that to audiences. I mean, one of the most profound lessons I've learned during the course of the referendum is the fact that anecdotes are infinitely more powerful than data sets. And that one story about a Romanian taking someone else's job in Lincolnshire is worth a million statistics about the two and a half billion pounds that East Europeans put into the UK exchequer net annually. And that, that art of political communication of economic fact, I think is something we have a lot to learn about. Mark. Hi, yes, uh, I'm Marco Incerti. I'm in charge of communications here, but I, in a previous life, yes, in a previous life, I was a think tanker and I was able to watch this process up close, starting, in fact, with the balance of competencies review, which, in fact, in a sense, is uh, contradicting something you said earlier. But a, a, a couple of points, because this has been so rich, and thanks for really a fascinating lecture, as everyone else has said. Uh, just briefly on what Adrien was saying, uh, uh, the economic uh, inequalities and what this can teach us, I think one other dimension is also the societal cleavages, which actually uh, uh, change the political alignment uh, 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 that was previously there. And this is not just specific to the UK. I'm thinking about this because I saw your map about uh, Pratt. And you will remember there was the same map, but with the coal mine um, uh, villages, basically. Yeah. So it's it's actually change of completely uh, uh, the working class vote, basically there. Um, but my actual question is linked to the, the part that you were just referring to a moment ago, and that is in fact uh, uh, also stemming from this last graph you have there. And the question is about the role of the media uh, in actually shaping. Uh, public opinion and in actually making the UK different, as you said earlier, because you again, uh, as you mentioned a second ago, the actually, I think it was top three, or if not the first most salient point at Brexit was migration, which actually was code for free movement. And that has disappeared from there, including because, of course, it was not at all a problem, as had been uh, ascertained by many observers. Um, so I think that's something that also is worth looking into. I mean, the current prime minister is a former notoriously inaccurate uh, uh, correspondent from Brussels. I remember, and this is, sorry, my last anecdote, uh, the moment the Treaty of Lisbon came into force, I was asked for an interview uh, with the BBC and their only question was like, now that there is article 50, are we allowed to leave? So this was way before the referendum. And, and that, I think that's, a sort of seismic change, uh, tectonic shift, if you want. And it's not to answer your question, but I think that's needs to be kept in mind. No, thank you, that's really, I mean, I'd be careful of saying, you know, we now know that immigration wasn't a problem. I mean, there were issues around, there were, there were genuine issues around freedom of movement. Uh, and I think one of them was the fact that no one else allowed East Europeans in as from 2004, and the assumption of the British government was that everyone would do so, and therefore, you know, I mean, one of the, one of the, one of the paradoxes of this, I think, is that Brexit, in a sense, in, was initiated by the UK being more European than other member states, which is simply saying, yeah, come here, and far more than we thought. And then we did, then that happened not once, but twice, because by the time of the Eurozone crisis, we sort of, the UK became a labour market of last resort for a currency we weren't in. 
you know, you get this tremendous increase in the number of Southern Europeans coming. So there were issues, and I'm not saying, you know, immigration is bad. What I'm saying is there is something quite significant going on. A lot of those people came to poorer parts of the United Kingdom. You know, one of the paradoxes, another paradox about Brexit is immigration hasn't gone down. We've got a massive rise in non European immigration into the United Kingdom. Why aren't the British people kicking off about that? Well, one of the reasons they aren't kicking off about that is because of the point system. These are educated, well-paid people, right? So they're going to cities. And in cities, people are educated and tolerant and cosmopolitan and young, and the cities don't mind. We don't mind immigrants in cities. It's in the poorer parts of the UK where the Romanians used to go to pick fruit or things like that. So there's a sort of, there's a political geography of immigration that has shifted profoundly, that having a sudden change in the number of immigrants in places that aren't doing very well economically is very different politically than having it into richer cities. Uh, just the other thing I would say, which you would talk about societal cleavages, and there's a couple of points I would make. One, they are very long term, this drift, this change. One of the things we forget about, I mean, it's one of the most staggering sort of statistics for me in British politics is when Labour were re-elected with a massive majority in 2001, they had three million fewer voters than they had in 1997. Three million voters just left the Labour Party. And a lot of those voters are the people who floated around, experimented with UKIP, and then ultimately came and voted Conservative in 2017 and 2019. So there's been a long-term disengagement, uh, particularly amongst sort of working class voters uh, from the Labour Party, which, and, you know, one of the things that annoys me about this is there was a sort of contempt on the part of the political elites who basically knew they could keep getting elected because of our electoral system. So actually we don't need those voters. Uh, and there was a sort of conspiracy that said, in which case we don't need to do anything about it. But actually there was, you know, 20 years of neglect behind this in a sense. And a lot of it was linked to the nature of our electoral system. And actually one of the things that we have now that has fundamentally changed is that the marginal seats are in different places now. That is changing public policy as a result. This um, this point you make about public policy is a perfect dovetail into Bernard Hoekman's question, uh, which is that the, the difference between richest and poorest regions as a correlate with the leave vote is really striking. Uh, does that mean that aside from values, there was also an implicit sense that EU membership was a factor driving inequality? If so, that may undercut arguments that the economic cost of Brexit is high in aggregate. After all, internal distribution of income is determined by domestic policy, not EU membership. And this seems to be reflected in current policy. It's a really good question. I would say no. I don't think there was a perception that EU policy was driving inequality. I think there was a perception, A, that the EU was part of that political blob that had been letting you down for so long and B, that the EU was a waste of money. Uh, that we were set, you know, the simplistic argument that we were sending loads of money to the European Union that actually we could be spending at home was a very, very powerful. And actually, for me, if you think about that red bus, that, that red bus was interesting in so many ways. Firstly, it was red, right? Labour red. And it was deliberately Labour red because you were appealing to those people who didn't like David Cameron, who didn't <clears throat> like austerity, it said NHS on the side, which is like a trigger for the Brits. And, and it had an enormous amount of money written on the side as well. And that's the subliminal message. If you don't like what this government's doing to your, pub, to your public services, if you wish that the economy could be better and you wish more money could be spent on the things that you need, you vote to leave. I don't think that was because people thought, oh, yes, because the EU is making us an unequal country. I think it was because this was seen as a way of basically breaking that system. And you know, what, what Brexit did was basically shatter the kind of centrist liberal cartel that had ruled the UK for decades and has replaced it with something else. What the something else is, I don't think I've quite got my head around yet, but it's something profoundly different. And I think for Leave voters, that was the point, is you have this cartel that is socially liberal and economically liberal and therefore you know, doesn't like Mrs. Brown's boys, and you do, 
and isn't going to do much for you economically because they're into globalization and internationalization, vote against it. And I think it, it was about the whole shebang rather than a sort of well-developed sense that the EU was promoting inequality. Uh, for those of you on chat, if you're on Zoom, if you do want to ask a question, please do put it in the chat box. Uh, Radislav? Thank you. Uh, thanks very much for a uh, fantastic talk, uh, Anand. Uh, my name is Rad Zubek. I'm, I'm a um, German Air Fellow here at, at the UI. Um, I have two questions. The first one is uh, follows up on, on some of the early points about um, immigration. But my, my question is about the labor market. I wonder if you could say something more about the impact that Brexit has had on the, on the UK labor market. There was a perception before Brexit that uncontrolled inflows of labor uh, were depressing wages and, and low paid jobs. So what is the story uh, now, a few years later? I mean, do we actually see that wages are going up? Uh, that the skills gaps are being addressed, uh, that the, the overall impact is positive and it's being perceived as positive, mm -hmm. or, is the, um, or, or is it business as usual? Um, you alluded to um, um, the new inflows of, of immigrants from uh, outside of the EU. Um, you know, what, what's the impact on the labor market, basically? That's the first question. The second question is uh, very different relates to um, something I found really interesting in, in, in your talk about uh, the impact on the UK political system. Um, because it seems to me that what you're arguing is that the UK political system is reverting back to type uh, with uh, a, a, an executive that is dominating parliament uh, and dominating courts. Um, so this is quite interesting. Uh, I wonder whether this is, is this sort of a limited to Brexit related areas? Uh, or is this a broader uh, trend of executive ascendancy uh, that we are witnessing um, in, in Britain today? Thank you. Let me do those in, in reverse order again. It's a broader pattern, because it's reflected in the UK, in the London government's treatment of the devolved governments, with things like, for instance, the internal market bill, uh, so, you know, this is a government that doesn't like constraints on government, basically. Uh, and, you know, whether it's Parliament, whether it's the courts, whether it's the European Union, uh, they chafe against people limiting what they can do and try and change that. And, you know, it's interesting, you're already getting some Conservative MPs who are dissatisfied with the lack of parliamentary oversight over a number of things. You know, there was an argument just the other day about the fact that the British government had released the terms of the free trade agreement with New Zealand without presenting them to parliament first. So this is a recurring thing and it's causing some, it might be slightly unfair when you say the UK political system reverting to type, because of course, you know, under, you know new Labour introduced constraints on central government, loads of them, you know, devolution was introduced by, uh, which limited the power of central government. The super, you know. You can argue about the way we do these things that, you know, perhaps the best way to create a Supreme Court is not for Tony Blair to write it on the back of an envelope one afternoon and then do it the next day without anyone thinking it through or, you know, we, we do these things in a rush. Uh, but it's not always the case that the executive acts like that. Uh, within the broader Brexit thing, one interesting discussion is that the sort of the unelected has become even more of a pejorative than it already was. And that again was part of the whole system, you know, unelected people that we haven't voted for telling us what to do. Uh, that's judges now. Uh, and, you know, it was civil servants for a while during the heat of the Brexit process. So that, you know, the, the nature of our debate about these things is shifting. I'm not sure where public opinion, there's, there's a really interesting exercise carried out by UCL, Alan Rennick, they did, a massive survey last summer and a series of citizens assemblies uh, at the end of last year on what people think about the UK's democratic system. Uh, and it's worth having a look at the outcomes from that because actually it's quite interesting. There is very little support for the government's positions on the courts there. Massive majority of people think the court should be able to overrule politicians on certain things. So there's not necessarily a groundswell of public opinion in favor of this. But it's, it's a debate that's, that's, that's kind of going on. 
On the labour market, it's hard, isn't it? I mean, again, because you've got so many things swirling around at the same time. Yes, in some areas, wages have gone up in a desperate attempt to attract people to that profession. But inflation has gone up by more. Uh, you know, every week, it seems to me, people are revising their inflation forecasts. But I think now we're sort of over 7%. And, you know, we were confidently being told a few months ago they were going to peak, it'll peak at 5 And, of course, with the war going on, that gets worse and worse. So there's a lot of rhetoric about creating a high-wage, high-skilled economy at the moment. All it seems to be doing is creating a high inflation economy because there's no one talking about a high productivity economy. And of course, if you're increasing wages without increasing productivity, that's problematic. Uh, how much of this is a, a post COVID, post Brexit spike? How much of it is people who have left the UK because of COVID but might come back because they've got settled status? I mean, remember, there are six million people with settled status now. And a huge proportion of those people aren't in the UK anymore. What we don't know is whether, as things go back to normal, those people want to return to the United Kingdom or not. But at the moment, yeah, wages are going up. There is a labour shortage. I don't think there is that necessarily proves the fact that freedom of movement had a statistically significant downward impact on wages during membership. I think the, the Bank of England did a very, very detailed study where they found a tiny impact on the lowest decile that was, you know, statistically very, very small indeed. But again, I go back to my earlier point that anecdotes are far more powerful. And anecdotes were really powerful when it came to things like that. You know, one builder who said there's this Polish idiot who's just nicked my business was worth a thousand Bank of England charts. So we have two final questions, and they're both both from colleagues on Zoom. The first is from Anya Thomas, who said, um, Anon, you said parliamentary representation was perfect. Uh, what about the outcomes of Brexit for, Brexit for other forms of participation, i.e. the recentralization of decision-making processes and agricultural policy? Uh, and, and then the, the final question is from Kieran. Uh, should the European Union Commission, Council, whatever, President, uh, have intervened in the referendum debate in 2016? Uh, should it actively promote reaccession in the medium to long-term looking to the future? Okay, uh, Kieran, no and no. I think are my answers to those. Uh, I think all countries sort of don't like what they see as foreign interference. I think we're probably more prickly than most when it comes to it. I don't think there's anything Jean-Claude Juncker could have said during the referendum in 2016 that would have helped. Uh, and I think it was actually a British official, uh, Jonathan Fall, who was advising him to stay well out of it. And I think Jonathan was absolutely right. I don't think rejoining is on the agenda of British politics at the moment. I think even if we get a Labour government, there'll be a bit of fiddling with the TCA, but not a fundamental rewrite. I don't think rejoining comes back onto the agenda for a long time. Uh, for a number of reasons, I think. One, because Labour need to get Leave voters back, and the Tory party is a Brexit party now. Uh, but two, because I think the first politician that starts to utter the idea of let's have a long negotiation for going back into the European Union is probably in danger of getting stoned, because the one thing the British people want is an end to this. You know, if the, the, you know, they don't want to hear European Union. The whole thing has sort of scarred the national psyche. Uh, so I just think that's a long way off. And yeah, that was slightly hyperbolic in retrospect, what I said about Parliament, for which I apologise. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it's interesting. We're, we're just as a, as a sort of, I mean, as a natural experiment, Britain is just fantastic now, isn't it? Because we're sort of rebuilding our political economy from the bottom up, whether it's a new immigration system, whether it's a new agricultural system. So partly it's a new agricultural system and the new rules look really interesting. And in terms of the provision of public goods, you know, it could be that this we've actually devised quite a nice system. I mean, I have to say that if we couldn't devise a better system than the common agricultural policy, then God help us. But anyway, uh, but the political economy of that, that's to say the degree to which farmers are being consulted and so on, seems very different to the old days. And I do wonder to what extent that model can last. One of the really interesting political economy questions about the UK at the moment is how little influence economic interests in general 
seem to have over government decision making. And that's a hangover from the referendum and the fact that in the early days of 2016 and 2017, businesses were basically shut out. Businesses and the Treasury were basically shut out of decision making, which is weird for the United Kingdom. I wonder whether it will re uh, revert to type. And actually, one of the interesting political debates around this is that you'll hear Labour Party figures openly saying we have an opportunity to become the party of business because the Tories are failing business so badly. So it's a moment of real flux. I hope that was an answer. And I'm sorry for my hyperbolic remark about Parliament. Well, Anon, we've, we've run out of time, I'm afraid, but this has been a fascinating conversation. It's certainly been wide ranging and I know everybody who participated has enjoyed it. So thank you very much for coming and thank you for your presentation.